Hey everyone, it's Bob Crossan, Senior Managing Editor for Water and Waste Digest. I am here today with Sri Vidachalam. He is the Director of Water Equity and Climate Resilience at ECT Inc. And this is another one of our 2022 WWE Young Pros. And you'll notice that we've been doing these videos every single week this month. Uh, we're reaching all of them that way. You can check out the video description below for a playlist of all the videos to date, as well as some Q&As on all of them. This is simply a snapshot of those Q&As in a visual form. To let you understand them a little bit more from a character and professional perspective. So thank you so much. And uh, let's get into this video interview with Sri. So Sri, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So uh, congratulations on being a young pro as well. <laughs> so uh, we get a lot of nominations. Yeah, we get Thank a lot you. of nominations for this over or, or every single year. And to be one of the 10 that we featured is is certainly an honor. And I, I appreciate I appreciate you and the work that you've done. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you got to where you are? You've done a lot of policy work and stuff, but uh, what was your career path? How did you get to here? I, I did not start off as a, a policy specialist. I did not think this was a thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they had no idea growing up. So I, uh, I, I grew up in India, uh, did my schooling there and also my undergraduates. So I, I got a degree in uh, mechanical engineering um, and I had a limited sort of worldview of, you know, what that meant and, you know, where I could go from there. Uh, and then I worked for about a year in a construction company um, and that was not very exciting. Um, <laughs> I did not like that. <laughs> uh, but I had got a job straight out of college, um, right before I finished college, actually. So I was excited for that job. But then once I was into that job, I was like, oh, this is not something I want. Um, so I decided to apply for graduate school um, in the United States. I was also considering some other countries, um, primarily Germany, but I ended up coming to the US. Um, and then um, I, I did my master's in engineering. And while I was doing that, I actually got um, uh, into some interesting conversations, some meetings, uh, uh, especially on a trip back home. Um, I was volunteering for a nonprofit in, in graduate school, uh, which has a university uh, chapter there with other students. And then on a trip uh, back home, I visited one of the projects that they were sponsoring and one of the activists who was uh, involved with them. Um, and he was, uh, you know, the way the project that he had put together and, you know, he had uh, essentially worked with a group of uh, villagers whose whose uh, local community was affected by industrial pollution uh, from a from a chemical factory, um, and and the way that they had um, uh, informed the residents of the challenges of the pollution, but also giving them the tools how to sample air quality, how to sample water quality, and then have a dedicated set of recordings, and then use that to go to the the quarterly meetings of the of this company. Uh, the investor meetings and, you know, give the investors and stockholders the results and say, this is what your company has been doing to us. Uh, I thought that was pretty powerful. So that gave me uh, an insight into how, you know, environmental monitoring um, can be beneficial. It can, it can inform the community, it can engage the community, and it can help the community. So it's not somebody from the outside coming in and saying, this is what you need, this is what needs to be done. So that, that really moved me. I mean, I, I thought that was eye-opening for me. Um, and I was like, you know, I want to know more about this. I want to be uh, in this field. And uh, I had no idea how, but, you know, uh, I, <laughs> um, so I read up a lot. I, I talked to a lot of people. Uh, and then I thought the best way for me uh, being in the U.S. was to go through graduate school, you know, continue being in school and learn a lot more. Uh, and then, you know, get, put myself in this, in this industry. So that's what I did. So I, I got into a PhD program. Um, and uh, so I did a PhD in environmental science and uh, a master's in environmental economics uh, simultaneously. So I could, you know, absorb as much of the, of the subject as possible. Uh, and then after that, I've, I've been in the water sector ever since. Yeah, so environmental is generally pretty broad. Was there a reason that you were gravitated more toward the water element of things? Was it specifically uh, because of those like, that like helping out that community and seeing like the impact it had, or was it more? It, than it was it was a factor. I wouldn't say I was tied to to water at that point. So I was pretty okay. open. I I was considering working with uh, uh, a faculty who was broadly working on climate change and energy. Um, that was one of the options. But I mean, I I don't think I had uh, a particular interest at that point. Uh, but once I got in, I got, I got hooked into the, I mean, like other fields, like energy, like housing, you know, transportation or any water is a multi, you know, sort of multidisciplinary field. So you, yeah. you bring a lot of expertise uh, and then you can, you know, you can bring in 
um, engineering, the physical sciences, uh, you know, a lot of social sciences, planning, uh, computer science. I mean, you know, it's just, uh, you know, an amalgamation. And so you get to learn a lot. So I really like that as, as I learned more and more, I was, I was picking courses from different programs. And at, at the end of it, I, I looked up uh, at the end of my graduate school, I had picked up programs, uh, courses from 11 departments across the campus. Um, and, you know, so that was just, you know, it's, it was informative for me, learning from different perspectives, and that still informs my thinking today. Yeah, at case in point, your title <laughs> includes climate resilience. So the climate side of things is still there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about some of the body of work that you've done and some of the things you're particularly proud of so far that you've done in the water industry? I'm really interested to learn about those and um, why they, why those particular things were so important to you as well. So um, so maybe just walking through a little, little bit of a history. I saw you, right after you know I did my uh, graduate school, this was um, not a particularly good time for getting a job. This was 2011. Uh, the economy was not doing well. But I was lucky to land a job at the, the Water Resources Institute at Cornell University, uh, which was really exciting because it, it allowed me to work with uh, not just the university, but also uh, a state agency as their you know, sort of core partner. So I, I worked a lot um, in, you know, close, closely with the, with the staff at the state agency, trying to understand what's, what's helpful to them, what is you know, their agenda, and how can it be beneficial to you know, their constituents and their, and their residents of the state. Uh, and that sort of opened out, you know, this this bigger sort of worldview of policy and and how close it is to politics, um, you know. So so that that sort of informed me. And since then, I've you know been able to expand, um, starting from. So I did my PhD on septic systems. So that was sort of my core expertise at that time. But from there, I you know started to learn more and more about centralized wastewater treatment plants. How do they work? You know, what are the different permits? And you know, then on to drinking water. What are you know what is you know guiding that. Uh, you know, process there. Um, and, and so I've, you know, slowly sort of expanded from there. And, and that's been really helpful. One project that really comes to mind, it's, you know, a project more becoming a mission was um, my, my last job um, was at uh, an organization called Epic Environmental Policy Innovation Center. Um, it's a, you know, DC based think tank. And um, I was hired there to start, a, you know, to do a, a report essentially for a, for a large uh, foundation on um, the health equity that's built into the water sector. So what are the implications? If you don't have good access to drinking water, wastewater, stormwater services, um, how can it impact uh, public health? And so that was the sort of initial task. Um, and um, you know, I walked in and, and was given that challenge. Um, and it was really interesting because obviously the proposal had been written before I came, so I had no say in that. Uh, so one of the core pieces that was built in was it was not going to be a review of, you know, just reports and literature and my thinking, but it was going to be informed by, you know, several dozens of interviews with experts in the water sector and knowing and learning from them what they think is uh, important, what they think are the challenges, what they think are the solutions. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a pretty interesting ways, interesting way of doing things because I learned a lot from that. I, I spoke to nearly a hundred people um you know doing, <laughs> doing this so you know exactly the kinds of interviews that you're doing and you said you learn a lot i mean this is you know i learned a lot doing those interviews and a few of those in-person sessions this was right before covid you know we, we wrapped up uh we actually wrapped up the writing during covid uh, as the beginning oh, wow. but most of the most of the the travel and the in-person visits were you know concluded before that so i really learned a lot and we put out a a, a report that's uh, essentially laid out a framework of, you know, what are the challenges in the water sector? What are the opportunities there and, and who's doing, identifying some players as, you know, these are the people who have been doing some innovative novel things and we should be expanding. So it did two things. One, it laid out a good foundation for what Epic should be doing. So, you know, this was essentially a report for, hey, this is a, you know, a project for what we should be doing. Um, that became useful as Epic expanded, you know, you know, in terms of growing. And then we started hitting on those different topics and, you know, building portfolios in there. Uh, but it the, the main goal of the project was actually to deliver to this foundation and give them, you know, that, that sort of, you know, roadmap of, you know, what they should be doing. So they wanted to invest in the water sector. And they were like, we have no idea. We want to know, you know, who should be funding? What are the things we should know? Uh, and I think we did a great job of, you know, sort of giving them a roadmap of these are all the places uh, where you can have an impact with your dollars, with philanthropic money, 
but with local participation, with you know state support, leveraging federal funding, these are all the things you could do. Um, and since then, they have been um, becoming a you know a really critical player in the water sector. So I'm so I'm you know I'm really glad that you know I was able to play a role in that project. Yeah, and to see the fruit of your labor, to mm -hmm. like spreading out and recognizing how impactful it's been, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of the things I think from the questionnaire and from the nomination form that we recognize, one of the reasons why we really wanted to highlight you was not only those things that you just mentioned, uh, there was also the Legislative Fellow Program where you helped work on Water Sense and AWEA and stuff, um, but also just like the absolute ambition that you have. <laughs> like, like it's something that, that it's really rare to find and, ca and capture so like concretely i feel like and i wanted to ask you a little bit about that about like your ambitions and and your aspirations like where do you want to head in the water industry like you've i feel like you've laid such a great foundational work of like i know how to do really big projects and get a lot of stakeholders together but what does that mean for your future what do you see i would have uh, you know liked to be the first uh, indian american to be the head of epa's office of water <laughs> uh, which, <laughs> which sadly, but also I'm, I'm glad to say that um, Radhika Fox is, you know, occupying that position. And, uh, you know, I'm really glad because she won. She's, you know, truly accomplished and, you know, a great person. Uh, but also she's opening up, uh, you know, pathways for people like me. Um, you know, I have very few, you know, connections to, <laughs> to people. Uh, I'm a, you know, true outsider, as the word goes, um, you know, coming from another country. Um, so, you know, it's, it's challenging to make those personal and professional connections with people. And so I'm glad that people like her make it, you know, easier for me to go to the next step in my career. Yeah. How do you anticipate your generation also like moving a little bit more to like a, a wider lens, I guess, is how do you anticipate your generation will Im influence the water industry? Like I, I recognize in the responses that you've given so far, you recognize how much value you get to bring to larger communities. Is that like how does that transit translate to acceleration for the water sector in certain areas? I, I think every every generation has um, its own sort of challenges and opportunities and the in the environments that they face. Um, and the you know this generation uh, is is facing a brutal uh, environment. There have been you know there's been a great depression. Um, there has been 9/11 um, wars in Asia and now Europe. Um, you know extreme um, political you know turbulence, uh, economic economic inequality. Um, and, and so a bunch of reasons and for good and bad, these are the forces that will shape this, this generation. Um, so it will influence how they see the world. It'll, um, it'll impact the contributions that they make. Uh, and it'll also put a worldview that, you know, they, they see the world through these, uh, you know, these prisms. Um, so I think that, you know, one, it builds a level of resilience and character uh, in the generation because they've faced a lot and they've seen a lot uh, in their short time span. But it also means that um, there are some challenges. We are losing behind some people. We are not bringing along everyone, but at the same time, there is growing diversity in the sector. There are more opportunities. There are more um, you know, tools and technologies um, that are available. The data is you know, becoming much more easier to access. So, so you know, some good and bad, but I, I think this generation certainly brings a lot of um, some of these talents and you know, the ability to work across different industries, the cross-disciplinarity, uh, the ability to work across cultures. I mean, those are pretty strong points. I think this generation has really picked up. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. I, I think that that, yeah, like I, I like that you framed it too with uh, just the life experiences that everyone in this generation has kind of gone through and how that might mm -hmm. shape the way that they approach problems too. Uh, I think that that's a a critical element that oftentimes gets overlooked right like we're talking about things in such a stereotypical way and we don't really put the emphasis on like what is the environment in which this all happened right yeah, um, yeah. that's a really insightful thing i appreciate you bringing that up because i i hadn't really thought about that connection before this if i'm honest so <laughs> um Pivoting a little bit more to the personal side of things, you said, I mean, you said you grew up in India. You mentioned in your form that when, when you were growing up in India, you were in a very urbanized environment and that coming mm -hmm. to the States and having access to more green areas and that type of thing was uh, almost like a culture shock in a little bit of a way. Uh, could you talk about your experience of, of like that and like what that meant and how that may have informed what you're doing with your work now? Sure. Um, so I grew up in Delhi, which is the country's capital and the second largest metropolis in the world. Um, so mm -hmm. it is after Tokyo. So it's a pretty urban environment. 
Um, it's rapidly growing and, you know, it's probably doubled or tripled since I left uh, the city. Oh um, so, you know, you can, you, as you can imagine, you know, a, sort of a crowded city, um, you know, it's high on air pollution, green spaces are limited, local streams and rivers have been paved over or lost, um, you know, just because of, you know, urban development. So you don't get to access green spaces a lot. I mean, there were some little parks that we would, you know, plain uh but you know it's not like you know you go out and suddenly you are in a wooded forest like you know you would here in the u.s um after, after driving for a few miles even if you live in a big city um so so that that is a certainly a big uh you know shock coming from you know from india to the u.s where obviously you you still end up living in you know urban environments if you go to <laughs> university campuses or visit big cities uh but at the same time you have access to um, you know, forest and trees and, you know, you know, rivers and, you know, wild spaces that, you know, that have been left untouched. I mean, those are really, you know, some blessings that, um, that, you know, you get to enjoy. But at the same time, you also understand that, you know, this, um, you know, the distribution of water in our, on our planet is not uniform. So, you know, here you have, you know, proximity to, you know, large pools of water like the Great Lakes and other rivers, freshwater streams uh, that hold a lot of water as opposed to, you know, countries like India that are perennially water starved because one, it is a lot of people and second, it is a, you know, hot, dry environment. So, you know, you, you start immediately feel, you know, the value of water and, and how it informs. I mean, I've, I've not had, you know, if, if you're in India, you, you would be pretty fortunate if you have access to 24 seven, you know, water supply. It's, it's not a guarantee that, you know, you open your tap and you get water. So I've, I've grown up in an environment where you, you know, you, you had water access for some part of the day. And sometimes it would be unpredictable, especially in the summers when the supply is limited, um, you know, it'll be regulated two hours in a day or two hours every alternate days, you know, at some point, you know, it was, wasn't fixed. Um, so, so those are, you know, experiences that still sort of shape me and inform me as, you know, in, in how I think about, you know, water access and, and why it should be available to everyone, but at the same time, you know, the, you know, just the, the benefit of having that, you know, that it's, it's a blessing to have that infrastructure even where, you know, you can turn on the tap and you get water. It's, it's not, it's not permanent. It's not universal, even in the U S you have households that don't have access. You have places where the water is tainted or you know discolored or smells funny. You have water that has actual contaminants, chemicals. You have places where people feel like it's you know something is wrong, even though the water is clean. So you know you you know you you get to see all of that. Uh, it just helps me put that in context when you know when I think about you know uh, life on the other side of the planet. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought up the conversation on the value of water and like how you experience the value of water and how that's so can be very different here in the United States that like people mm -hmm. kind of really do take it for granted here, like totally 100%. Um, have you maybe this is part of like the, your new work now is like communicating that value of water. Is there a way that you are looking to try and express that to the broader general public? Because I feel like within the water sector, we all get it. But like getting breaking out of that bubble and connecting yeah. with the people yeah. inside, that's always the challenge, right? Yeah, it's it it is, it is a challenge, and it, it is a challenge we should embrace. And I feel like not everybody is getting that to that point. Um, mm -hmm. So this is an anecdote from uh, a, a general manager who um, you know from a mid-sized utility who told me a couple of years ago, and he said that when he joined the force, you know, joined the industry. Uh, probably in the mid 80s, uh, he was told by his supervisor that make sure that we are not in the papers. That's your job, you know. So, you know, the, the goal was make sure that, you know, the word does not get out. Nobody talks to us. You know, we don't get any negative feedback. Um, nobody obviously is going to give you positive feedback. I mean, I wish people were calling up and, you know, the utility and saying, hey, my water tasted good. Everything is good. I'm just so glad that I woke up and, you know, there's, there's water in the shower. I flushed the toilet and there was water there. I opened the faucet, made my coffee, there was water there, you know, everything is great. Of course, nobody does that. Uh, but, you know, you don't get negative feedback. So that that's sort of the driving uh, motto of the industry, you know, for many decades. Um, and that's just not going to cut it anymore. It's, it's you know, we, we live in an environment where communication is important. There is dis and misinformation going on. So if you're not actively taking, seizing that space, somebody else will. Somebody else will say, your water is not safe. 
here I have a product for you. Here I have a tool for you. You know, uh, whether it's a you know a, a chemical supply, a, a water purifier, or you know a whole you know a bottled water, anything. So you need to seize that that communication uh, you know tool, the the space between you and the customer. And you know we have to actively do that. And I've I've been you know working on that space because I I think I think that's where um, that there's a lot of gap between reality and um, sort of you know what the what the public expects um, and what they're getting. So you know one of the projects that I led uh, in Epic right before I left was um, developing a a template for CCRs, the uh, consumer conference reports that every utility uh, has to send out uh, once a year. Which will become twice a year once the new regulations come in, but 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 that's that's vehicle where where utilities communicate with the public, and they're required to communicate in essence. Uh, but again, we are doing a, not a great job because of the way these reports are structured. They're so dense; they use you know lots of jargon. There's you know you have to be like a chemistry major to understand it. It's written at a really high level. Uh, only available in English. I mean, I can go on and on. Um, so, you know, we work with uh, uh, a company called Raftalis, uh, which, you know, has been doing a lot of these projects uh, with individual utilities, but we wanted them to, you know, develop a template where anybody can plug in the information, a small mid-sized utility and, you know, generate their own CCR, which is much more accessible, uh, user-friendly, a little more, you know, visual in nature rather than just text. So, you know, you know, I, I think this is a space where, a lot needs to happen in communicating the value of water and communicating the importance. At the same time, utilities should be open to hearing what is the problem. You know, why is there why is there gap between the public's expectation and the and the product that they are receiving? Um, so you know, a lot of a lot of innovation in this space. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I've heard this from uh, we, I recently did a video interview with one of our other young pros, Chelsea Boozer, and she talked a lot about this being a very high value point for her mm -hmm. and her communication strategies with the public and whatnot. So I I loved her. I have to connect you guys together because I think you'd have a lot to talk about. <laughs> um, la last question here is one I'm asking all of the young pros, and that is how would you cater to the next generation of water professional? I think part of your previous answer might actually just tie in perfectly with this. Yeah, so one is communicating the value of water <laughs> to the public. I mean, we have to actively do that job. Um, you know, it's not, I mean, as, as I said in the beginning, nobody tells you that this is a career option, like, you know, doing water policy or running a utility or, you know, um, you know, communicating with the public. Uh, you know, those are not seen as traditional career paths. I mean, you're a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer, you know, things like that. Um, so we have to, one, build that process where we say these are you know jobs that are in your local economy where you work with the environment where you work with the people you work with institutions uh, and then you know do a whole sort of greater good uh, for all of them uh, but you know so in my own ways you know I've been trying to do that um, I especially like working with young professionals younger professionals who are younger than me who are just starting out in their fields um, you know people who are coming out of colleges and you know just getting to put their feet um, and and that's been a you know really you know I I think it's a great experience for me over the years. I worked with lots of student interns, um, you know, who have interned with me, whether I was at a university or in you know other organizations, where you get to really shape them and bring them up to speed on you know one topic, one project that they work on, and they suddenly you know it opens their eyes and they're like you know I now understand how the you know the lead service lines are installed or, you know, I understand how drinking water is regulated or how water quality is communicated, you know, just one aspect and suddenly they're like, I, I, I can now read other things because I know the same keywords and now I'm very interested in either the water industry or I'm interested in the environment space uh, and they go on to seek, you know, master's degrees or internships or other jobs, um, you know, that, you know, really place them in that field. So that's, that's been my um, you know my contribution, small contribution to the to the field, and I think it's 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 great. We have you know a great set of people who are coming into the workforce. Uh, we need to make sure that we are retaining them, the ones that are already in the system. We need to make sure we are hiring them, paying them well, and then making sure the environment is right. I mean, you know, nobody's going to be able to work in a in a place that's not conducive for them. Not you know, the environment is not supportive of them. So taking into account the varied expectations of today's, you know, workforce, whether it's, you know, remote, partly remote, partly in the office, 
taking care of you know young parents you know accommodating needs you know disability or other family needs so i think all of those need to be in in a package which allows us to you know really recruit the best of the best uh, and and keep them in this field the environment is a crucial part of that as well. I feel like we keep coming back to the environment, but that was something that I talked with a couple of the other young pros about, which was, you know, getting them, getting these young professionals, interns or new hires, getting them involved with other, with industry associations at that young pros level, whether they're part of the committee or not, but going to a young pros event and meeting other people their age and creating friends outside your organization can establish the environment in which they thrive, right? Yeah. Like that's part of the environment that you need to, to right. uh, cultivate. I mean, the one thing that I always, I, I feel, and you, you probably heard this, one thing that I always excites people i mean whether it's an intern whether it's a new hire whether it's a you know mid-level industry professional um it's not the job that really matters at the end of the day it's the it's the wider contribution that they're making to the to the sector to the economy to you know a much bigger force that is you know beyond comprehension at this point like you don't know what's happening elsewhere but you know that this one thing is a small puzzle piece in the you know bigger puzzle and i think that's the that's the value and the, you know this the, the thing that you said of you know communicating or connecting with other professionals outside of their organization that's what it does it tells them that there are other people who are working on similar things who are doing similar contributions and all of those pieces put together makes a beautiful puzzle yeah yeah 100 percent. totally agree with you and uh thank you so much sri it's been great to talk to you about all of this stuff and uh, get a little it, thought man. leadership from you <laughs> <laughs> thank you and thank you for the honor i mean this is an elite company thank you yeah, yeah. And for everyone who's watching, check out the video description below. Like I said before, we've got a link to the playlist for all the videos to date, as well as the Q&As for all the young professionals. We've covered a lot here with Sri, but there's a lot more actually to be found in that Q&A as well, because the questionnaire is even longer. So thank you so much again, Sri, and uh, we'll catch you with the next one, everyone.